<laughs> we had our own, our own little version of the fishes in the loaves. <laughs> Kathy brought a breakfast casserole. It, it went surprisingly far. Yeah. Well, see, as you said, you made that announcement, Mike, but you're assuming that some of us are listening. <laughs> I, I know that I heard it when you said it, but it, it didn't stick. <laughs> so, Kathy said, I don't know why I didn't put it on the calendar. Well, the reason she didn't put it on the calendar is because... It didn't happen. Three weeks ago, we started, I guess I'd call it a series. I don't know that I had intended it to be a series, but it did. We, we looked at the idea of the mind of Christ, Christ's mind. What is Christ's mind? Excuse me? Yes, it, the, the scriptures contain Christ's mind, but what... What did we discover about Christ's mind in the scriptures? Ah, maybe we need to go back and, and, and do that one again. Um, I'll give you an example. Let's go, go to Romans 15. I'm going to do a little review. We remember in the Gospels, the Lord Jesus Christ said, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. That which sustains me, that which keeps me alive, is to do the will of the Father. And of course, from Philippians 2, we know what that is, right? He came and took on the form of a servant. It was made in the in the, in the fashion of as a man. Um, he suffered. He went through a process of being eternally and irrevocably identified with us through the choices that he made to be identified with us. Of course, we became eternally and irrevocably identified with him. But he was made in the form of a servant. And that type, that picture, symbolizes what the mind of Christ is. I picked this particular passage because I think it, it clearly demonstrates this. Paul says, we then, verse 1, that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Where in the world would the Apostle Paul get an idea like that? I mean, is that, was that his own personal philosophy? Is it, did he establish a, a, a school of theological thought that, that espoused this particular doctrine? Not really. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification, for even Christ. Please not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Now we go to that verse 4 from time to time, and, and, and we understand by reading the whole Bible that, that we do get comfort, we do get understanding. We can't understand the dispensation of the grace of God in, in totality unless we understood what came before. How do we understand what grace is if we don't know what law was? It takes the entire word of God in order for a believer to be established. But in the context here, when he's saying the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, he's referencing back to Christ and his mind of service. For even Christ pleased not himself. And that's an interesting statement to me. I've thought about that because he didn't please himself, but it pleased him to come and do what he did. So did he, did he not please himself or did he please himself? Yes. yes. <laughs> that, that's a conundrum. 
But it contrasts to what our natural man thinketh. Our mind is generally what's in it for me. Right? And the Christ decision, well, what's in it for me is what's best for you. And, and so we see this picture. He said, verse 5, Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded, one toward another, according to Christ Jesus. He said, again, you know, we have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This is the mind that he's talking about. That ye may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. I've talked about this verse a bit. That was a, that was a sea change. They don't use that expression much anymore, do they, Jim? But uh, sea change were espoused uh, in the secular world as something that was bringing a sweeping change in thinking and perspective and so forth. Used in a in a secular sense, I think it can be used in a in a spiritual sense. But uh, I can remember a period of time where many of you remember my friend Doug Dodd. We quoted this verse back and forth at each other. Wherefore receive you one another. Wherefore receive you one another. Wherefore receive you one another. Isn't that what Christ's mind was? That even as the Father of our Lord Jesus, uh, even uh, receive you one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. How did the Lord Jesus Christ receive us? Excuse me? Unconditionally. He received us just the way we are. And... There's a lesson in that. Yeah. That's the reason Paul has to say, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Because it doesn't come natural. It, it's, yet for some people it did come natural. Didn't we look at Timothy? He said, for I have no one that's like-minded that naturally cares for you. Well, why was it natural for Timothy and not for others. Because he was thinking with Christ's mind. And that's, that's where that takes us. Enough of that in review. The week after that, we uh, looked at study what? <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Again, a verse that we probably quote so much that it almost becomes trite. Who remembers our point about 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15? Excuse me? We're already approved. Most believers don't understand that. That's the reason he said study. If you don't study the details of your approval, what you don't know, you don't know. You know, we used, we used to say about certain people, they don't know that they don't know. <laughs> and most people don't know that they don't know what they don't know. And uh, that almost sounds funny, but in a sense that it's, it's, it's tragic. But the other point that we made about that is we are often bent to believe or to think about that verse that right division is the subject. It is not the subject. It, it, just, it just isn't. Um, excuse me? I can't hear you, so. It's all right. I don't, my hearing aids died. So I, I what... 
So you'll speak to me. I'll hear you, but I won't understand. It, it, I hear. Uh, it, uh, all right. Okay, that's all that matters. And again, right division is essential. I mean, this book is of no use to us without right division. Um, it is the means, not the subject. The subject and the context of 2 Timothy 2.15 is the quality of our work. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Not that God is going to be ashamed of us, but that we would work in a way that is shameful because it contradicts the principles of grace and, def and denies the approved status that we have before God. And, and you know the type of teaching that, that I'm talking about. Things that are you know, hung up in, in the wrong dispensation. Uh, laboring to try and press upon people a performance type system where they think they have to earn God's approval. And of course the, the tragedy of that type of thinking is we can't earn God's approval. God approves as his son. And the only approval that we have is because we're in him. I think of <laughs> that verse in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we looked at that where we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We, <laughs> can you imagine if we had to, to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? Can you imagine if our sins had to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? You know, it doesn't, we aren't judged there. Our sins aren't judged there. Our works are judged there. And he talks about those that are saved, yet so as by fire. You know? Sa saved, yet so as by fire. <laughs> yeah. Standing there with their pockets out, empty pockets. Of course, he goes on in chapter 4 and he talks about, and then shall every man have praise of God. <laughs> it, at least you, some of us had the good sense to receive the gift of grace. I mean, it should be a no-brainer. But it's not. But where would we be without right division? Where would we be if, if we didn't understand the difference between Israel and ch the church, the body of Christ? Yeah. Where would we be if we didn't understand the difference between prophecy and mystery? Or the difference between the kingdom gospel and the gospel of the grace of God? The difference between the ministry and, and commission of the twelve versus the ministry and commission of the Apostle Paul. The difference between living under the law or living under grace. You notice I, I said living under grace? <laughs> Words do mean things. If he said you're, we are not under the law, but we are under grace. The difference between expecting Israel's miracles and, and, and living in the power of God's grace. I, I, one of the things about Facebook just breaks my heart. You see someone's child has cancer or, or that somebody's in dire straits and, and they're all looking for a miracle. Or wondering why God is punishing them. Without right division, <laughs> we really lose our hope, don't we? Israel had a hope, but their hope, well, they were always looking for future deliverance. <laughs> We've been delivered. And we live in the context of that delivery. The consequence, we, you know, we look at things different. We pray differently. We don't pray looking for God's intervention, but we look at prayer as a means for affirming God's empowerment of the believer in any circumstance. Things that are different are not the same. Study what? That's what we study. 
So we started with Christ's mind. We went to study what? Then last week we started talking about Christ's life. A new life. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 says that we should walk in newness of life. And we began to sort of explore some of that. Uh, and we asked some questions. You know, for instance, you know, is, our, is it our old life made better? No. You know, there are a lot of lost people that live good lives. There are a lot of lost people that, that live happy lives. That's sad. Again, they don't know that they don't know. But much of man's activity is nothing more than a cheap anesthetic to, to really deaden the pain of, of, of an empty life. You see the, the machinations that people do to try and bring meaning to their life? You know the type of people I'm talking how about the drama, you know, the drama queens and the drama kings? By the way, it works on both sides. The people that always have to have some drama going on in their life. You, you look at that kind of person and you shake your head, you know. What's up with this person? But really, it's, it's sad. Because these people, that they need drama like food itself because it brings meaning and definition to their life. That's sad. It's pathetic. When we look at those people, we shouldn't feel this thing of, of condemnation toward them. What we should feel is pity. Our new life is something that's new and different. And that's part of the things that we need to, when we study, we have to study the details of what this new life is. You know, we've looked at the, the idea, the concept, the, found, the foundation, in a sense, but our new life is established in our new identity. And it doesn't make any difference which aspect of our Christian walk that we study. It all goes to back to, to the establishment foundation of understanding who we are in Christ. Because that, that changes, changes everything. It changes how we think about Christ. It changes how we think about ourselves. It should change about the way that we think about those around us. It, it should change the way that we think about our service. It's in Christ that the in Christ the, it's the new creature that matters. We looked at a, a passage in Galatians chapter six, two verses there. Galatians chapter six. All right. Verse fourteen. Writing to the Galatians, the Apostle Paul says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You could study that one for a while, couldn't you? That's along the same line of what he wrote to the Corinthians. He said, I purpose to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Staying close to the cross. Of course, most people think of that in the sense of, of justification, but I think that's the, the essential mental uh, foundation of uh, our sanctification. Because when, when you look at the cross, who do you think of? Now, he's not still hanging on that cross, but I know that he did. And understanding his mind is what helps me understand what took him there. And understanding, if we are to let that mind be in us, it lets me understand where I should be going in my thinking. See, that's the thing about, that's what 2 Timothy 2.15 is about. 
It's not about being able to understand your Bible, although it does that. Because if you don't understand your Bible, then you don't understand who you are in Christ. And you don't understand the mind that Christ had. And you don't understand the mind that we are to allow into our own thinking. We allow it in and it replaces the way that we normally think. So that we can be like Timothy. We're not naturally thinking about what's in it for me. We're naturally thinking about others. Because that's the way Christ thought. So unless we are established in our new identity, in Christ, we don't have a new life. It's amazing the number of people in denominational Christianity, if you want to call it that, sometimes I don't know if it's Christianity or not, they can read Romans chapter 6, and they can see that verse, and then they go running back to the Gospels, and they're trying to practice the Beatitudes, and, and, you know. I remember being in the Baptist church and listening to, I don't know, it must have been a 15 or 20 week series on the Beatitudes. And even as a teenager, I'm, you know, I'm, I couldn't stand it. It drove me nuts. And I didn't know much then, but I, just listening to that, I knew it wasn't right. And that bothered me because I said, how can this not be right? I mean, this, these are the words right out of Christ's mouth. Now, again, I didn't understand the difference between <laughs> Christ and, 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 and his kingdom glory and offering to the nation of Israel and, and Christ as he is, is my head in the body of Christ. It's, it's, it's different. But in Galatians chapter 6, we go on, he says, For in Christ Jesus, there's that in Christ again, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. That's what matters. Why can't we remember that? Because we get, in, we get ourselves into pickles, whether it's in relationships or, or uh, economic things or political things or you know, the stuff that we go nuts about. And we forget what matters is that we're a new creature. We keep hugging that old man. Sue asked me a question about the old man. Is he really dead? If he's dead, then how does, how does, how does he influence us? You ever thought about that? What influences us is the flesh. The old man's tied to the flesh, but I believe what the Bible says. It said he's dead. Well, then, if he's dead, how does he have an influence on us? How many of you have someone that that was very dear to you that's now dead that still influences your life? Absolutely. In fact, sometimes, whether positive or negative, and more often it's negative, where someone's had an influence in your life and you never get over it. Right? You know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? You ever wondered why drunkards raise drunkards? Or child molesters raise child molesters? Criminals raise criminals? Every person's responsible for their own choices, but every person is still, if they let themselves, influenced by people in their lives. It's the same way with the old man. He is dead. Deader than a doornail, as they would say. But we have a tendency to not forget those influences. You know, living in the old man can be comfortable. (laughs) That's like 
people that go to prison and they turn them loose and they, they can't go, wait to go out and commit another crime because they can go, so they can go back to prison. Where's the logic in that? Because they were comfortable there. We do the same thing with our old man. It's exactly what we do. We run back to the old comfort level. And it's, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And Paul intentionally uses circumcision and uncircumcision here because they represent definite things. They represent different identities, Jew and Gentile. They represent different worldviews. There's a vast difference in the worldview of the Jew and, and the Gentile, even today. It represents different religious perspectives and represents different approaches to living. See, it's, it's that, that new creature that changes all of that. We talk about being citizens of heaven. For our conversation is in heaven. Colossians chapter 3 says our life is in heaven. We keep thinking that our life is here. Day in, day out. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We looked at where Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, I don't know why I read this passage so much. I guess because it's, I need it. I need it. I need this perspective. This I say, therefore, verse 17, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, be, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. To be ignorant is to be alienated from the life of God. That's true for a lost person, and that's true for us. If we just study the scriptures, not rightly dividing the word of truth, we're going to think like other Gentiles do. Because when you get out of Paul's epistles and you go back into, into Israel, you're back into a performance system. The law never brought life to anyone. All it ever did was condemn. That's what it was designed to do. It represented God's righteousness and <laughs> man could never measure up. We can't do it today. They couldn't do it then. That's the reason he says we have to put on and put off. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of the hearts who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. You ever thought about that verse? <laughs> who being past feeling you see, emotion junkies are like drug junkies. They take their first hit. They get addicted. Guess what they discover after a while when they go to shoot that stuff up? They find out they don't... Mm -mm. So they do more. And they do more. And they do more. Emotional junkies are the same way. Unless they can find something extreme, they have no feeling at all. Religious people are like that. 
in much the same way. Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. Our new life in Christ gives us new appetites and new passions. And they're always satisfying. Always. He said, verse 21, If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on, put off. You know, that's a concept that I can understand. Yeah. Of course, I... I made fun of Kathy a little bit, but <laughs> in her, in her <laughs> inevitably every morning. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. Should I or should I not? No, I think you should not. <laughs> no. Oh, I, no. Oh, no. I learned better than that. That looks great, dear. <laughs> uh huh. But here's our mirror. That's where our wardrobe is. And just like the closet, <laughs> we can choose to put it on. Now, I don't always understand all the details of how that works, but it's like the old man being dead. I believe that because that's what the Bible says. I know that I can put on the new man because that's what it says. If I couldn't put him on, what would be the point? If, it's, if it was even hard to do. And that's what religion does. You know, Paul, he talks about those that were removed. He was worried about them, that they would depart from the simplicity that is in Christ. I think that's one of the ways that we can recognize what is good for our practice and what isn't. If it's complicated and it takes a lot of work, guess what? That ain't it. There's another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel. And much of the world is captivated by it. And they're out there just working away. There are people that know 2 Timothy 2.15 that know absolutely nothing about right division, but I'll tell you what, they're working. Some of them are a lot more diligent at it <laughs> than we are with the tenets of grace. Very faithful. Very passionate. Very lost. Or at, le or at the very least, alienated from God's life. So we're established in our new identity, and our new life is also founded well, in new power. You know, we, we were in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, you know, he said, Like as Christ was raised from the dead. Like as Christ was raised from the dead. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. Like as Christ was raised from the dead. Christ was raised from the dead. He was dead. Dead. We think this new life is something as complicated as it's supposed to be impossible. You would think, listening to, to many believers, that they think the Christian walk is impossible. Or at the very least, is extremely difficult. Not when the power comes from outside of us. And that power 
It's the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And Paul makes that reference in numerous places. God raised him up. Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. And I know I step on Fred a little bit, but... By the way, Fred and I do not call each other during the week and find out what the other is doing. Sometimes it looks like collusion, but it's not. Verse 4, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. Boy, that's pretty clear, isn't it? That ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should do what? Bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in what? There's that word again. Newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Hmm. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but the law for which I had not known lust except the law had said thou shalt not covet. Again, what was the purpose of the law? Yeah, it was to condemn us and, and focus on our imperfections, our sin. And in that becomes the difference in the perspective of religion and understanding grace. The law was like a microscope. You know, they didn't know what disease was and where it came from until they had a microscope that they could look in. They'd take a slide with man's blood in there and they'd put it under there and they'd look down in there and they, guess what? They saw little creepies in there. And I said, well, what are those? And so they discovered disease and they came up with treatments for it. The one thing they didn't do was to take the microscope and grind it up and eat it. But that's what religion does. They want to eat the microscope. All you're going to get is indigestion. You're certainly not going to get a cure. And he goes on in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. And I ask the question, does he? He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. See, we try to quicken this thing. Again, we think of, we think of this as, as a living body, don't we? <laughs> it's mortal, it's not living. We do reside temporarily. But it will return to dust. It is worm fodder. And we shall never, ever need it again. When we understand the foundation of our new power in Christ with the Holy Spirit in us, it enables us to do miraculous things. Verse 13, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. How many of you did something after the flesh recently? Are you dead? You look pretty lively to me. Obviously, it's not talking about physical death, is it? Just something to think about. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. That's the new life of the new creature that we have in Christ Jesus. We have the freedom and the power to live now not just in eternity, to, in the ages to come. 
like the question, and Sher Sherry always loved to answer it, she's not here, but I, I often ask the question, when does eternal life begin? The moment you trusted Christ as your Savior. What did Paul mean when he said, lay hold of eternal life? Does that mean keep looking for it? Keep waiting for it? Embrace it. It's a present possession. It's a part of our new identity and our new life. I mean, it is called eternal. What? Say it. Life. That's certainly different than the life I had before. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <laughs> all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me. All things, go back to the beginning, all things are lawful unto me. <laughs> Do I have the freedom to live in remembrance of my old identity and my old man? But all things are not expedient. Do I have to? See, that's the lost person. He, he doesn't have any choice. But I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and belly for the meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. <laughs> this thing that we have such affection for, again, returns to dust. God destroys it. He said, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord, and shall, raise, shall also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. And then you get this idea of, of possession. And we did a message on that a while back. I don't remember if it was here or someplace else. But the idea, you know, when, when, when Christ bought and paid for us, he bought the whole package. Not just our spirit and soul, but our body. And again, there's a different utility to that operation than the way we think. You know, we go to... Sam's Club, and then bring these things home, and then we're sitting here ready to curse, trying to get the stupid thing out of the cotton-picking package. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And then you get something sharp, and inevitably, you're going to... Yeah? And then what do we do with the package? It's, it's served its purpose. But, it's... but God can use the package. He recycles the thing. He brings life to this mortal flesh. That's power. We have the power to be joyous and peaceful. I think of Romans 15. We were there before. Verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. See, if our new life is not established in our new identity, and not founded in the new power that we have because of that identity, if we don't believe in that, or ignorant of that, we are alienated, not just from the life of God, but from the power of God, and any chance that we have for hope, or joy, or peace. I'm over time as far as I can go today. 
Father in heaven, again, we just thank you for the life that we receive from your word, and the enlightenment that we have as we study our identity in Christ and the, and the power that that brings to our circumstances. We thank you for the fellowship of the saints and for the presence of your word here among us. And we pray these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.